All right, everyone, I'm really excited about this artist series today because this guitar player is one of my biggest influences. When I was a kid, I went to my very first concert and it was a Kiss concert. And that was great because my first rock album was Kiss Alive. So it took a few years from that, but I finally got to see Kiss Live. Uh, Bruce was the guitar player in the band and I didn't know it then because I wasn't quite playing guitar at the time, but his playing influenced me. And I noticed when I started to put together this series that a lot of the techniques that he's using on these songs are ones that I use all the time too. So I wonder if I was just subliminally influenced at the time. So I'm real excited to show this to you guys today. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Uh, basically he lives up to his name, Bruce Kulik. I always call him Kulik because I think of Kulik's, but I've heard people say Kulik, but I'm going to say Kulik. So it's uh, Bruce Kulik's coolest licks and techniques today. So uh, I'm excited. Let's get to it. I really love the idea of contrary motion. And when I heard this lick, I was kind of excited because it's kind of a paradoxical lick. It's descending, but ascending at the same time. So here's what I mean. I used to do this practice all the time with pentatonic scales. I would do something like this. <laughs> So I'd basically do a pull off and come down three notes, one, two, three, then ascend to the next note in the scale, do three back. And so you're going backwards as you're going up. I call it uh, falling upward. So if you check this out in the song King of the Mountain, he goes like this. It's pretty, pretty quick, actually. But do you see how it's the same concept, just done in a really nice, tasteful way? So it's a really interesting sound, and it's a new way to do a pentatonic scale that you may not have been doing yet. You'll hear this a lot in Bruce's playing. It's kind of this idea of just hitting an open string and doing a smooth dive bomb off of it. Nothing sounds better than harmonics and open strings when it comes to bar dives. So let's see how he does it at the end of this last lick we just did. <laughs> Okay, so what I did was I just got to the end of the lick and I pulled off to the open G and I tried to as smoothly as possible, it's not as smooth as how he does it, but bring it all the way down to what I call ground zero. That's where it finally just gets to the bottom. It's also a great way to start a solo. So if you're not sure what to do to really just kind of make your presence known for the solo, go ahead and hit an open string that's in the key of the song, or even if it's not, it might sound cool, and just give it a big dive before you kick into your solo. Now there are a couple places in the song Any Way You Slice It that it sounds like he's doing extreme bends. One of them sounds like a two and a half step bend, but it, I'm not sure if it's a slide or a bend. But anyways, this one I know is a bend for sure. It's the idea of doing something like this. All right, so a lot of people would probably go like this. All right, that sounds pretty normal. And if you play things that a lot of people are used to hearing, nothing will really stand out of your solo. So sometimes you really want to just go that extra step. In this case, two step bends. This could be pretty tough because if you know your steps, that's going to be four frets. So it's pretty extreme. You're going to be going like this, bending up to here. So it's pretty insane. And if your guitar has really thick strings, let's say you're playing with 12s or something, this could be very difficult. So I recommend uh, building up to it. Don't just go right to it. One thing he does a lot is he'll be playing something, let's say, in the middle of the guitar. And after you bend it up, you sort of put the cherry on top by tapping a note. Just make sure it's the note you're looking for. Sometimes I mistap and I have to do an embarrassing slide. But we get this. <laughs> See how you could bend it and just keep it really steady? The one thing I like to do on top of that is after I do the tap to add that extra note at the top, I like to do vibrato, but a lot of people make the mistake of trying to do vibrato on the finger that's tapping. What I like to do is actually use my fretting fingers to do the vibrato while I hold down the tap. Works better for me. <laughs> So trills are already a really good exercise. I like to practice trills with all my fingers. So for warm up, sometimes I'll go first finger, middle finger, first finger ring, and first finger pinky. The pinky is kind of the toughest one, but I've worked on it my whole life, so it's pretty fast. But for today, I just, I'm just gonna do a trill with my ring finger, and I'm going to do it at the seventh fret and 10th fret on the second string. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the bar and I'm gonna slowly dip it as I trill. And this is something Bruce does quite a bit. It sounds just as cool coming up as it did going down. So you want to practice going both ways. It's sort of like a siren effect, if you will. All 
I think that's called the Doppler effect. It's kind of cool, like an ambulance going by into the distance. It makes that kind of sound where the pitch is dropping. It's a great thing to do with the Trem system. So here's a great thing he does in the song Who Wants to Be Lonely. Great song. It was stuck in my head all last night. Uh, so here's what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a concept that we do on one string, first of all. And we're just going to go down the string in threes. So... First time I learned Fade to Black by Metallica, I did a lot of that stuff too. Now, usually you want to speed that up so you start adding pull-offs and slides like I was doing. It's a cool way to sound fast, just work your way down the string. Putting it into a solo can be a little more tricky because sometimes you have to go across the strings while you do the same technique. So when you practice it, it's a good thing to go. I'm just doing a certain scale with that same pattern. He does it real quick and he ends with a bend in this particular song. I love the sound. See how musical it can be if you just uh, add a little bit of dynamics to it, plus like, other techniques such as the bend at the end. I love that. Okay, so what can be kind of difficult is coming out of something that fast into something where you're just bending. So you gotta work on the transitions quite a bit to make this really work, but uh, slow it down and see what happens. So just so you guys know, I don't. these are not exactly note for note what he does as far as the solos go, but I just wanted to bring the technique to light for the most part. So uh, don't think I'm trying to teach you kiss licks today or anything like that. These are mostly just technique based ideas. So in this particular case in the song, I'm Alive, he's up here at the 14th position. We're gonna go like this, 17, 14, 16, 14. I'm just gonna talk fret numbers and just in case you guys don't know the actual notes. Uh, I do that sometimes in my videos, in my artist series videos at least. We're gonna go like this. We're gonna do the pull off first, then the next pull off. Now this is the tricky part. We have to come down to the 17th fret on the B string and come back home to the 14th fret on the first string. So there's a couple ways to do this. So this versus both are relevant though, of course. Then you reach down and you do your little cross string thing. Or see how they both have their advantages and disadvantages. I do like the legato one. It just sounds smoother to me. But if you really want to get gritty and do more of like a Kirk Hammett thing, go ahead and pick that other pull off. That's fine. Pretty slick sounding though once you get it sped up, huh? All right, I was excited for this song. Tears Are Falling is probably one of my favorite Kiss songs of all time. I could just listen to it on loop. It never gets old to me. Anyway, a big part of the solo that sticks out to me is the huge stretch he does. He does this cool pull-off stretch sounding thing. I didn't know what it was until I really studied it. And then I realized I actually was doing this a long time ago. Remember, I was talking about being extreme with my stretches. But a weird thing happens if you do stretches like this and you go across the strings, sometimes you get this unison effect where you're hitting the same note on two different strings. So this happens and tears are falling as far as I know, it's as far as I've studied. And it's this idea. It's interesting to me because you're doing this kind of familiar pentatonic move. Like you would normally go maybe. Because you're stretched so far with your fingers, it, it creates that unison effect that I was talking about. See that? So you get this. It's confusing to figure out because it sounds like you're doing this. Just all on one note, but you're not. You're doing two different places, so it feels right to play. And of course he finishes it with that really cool. So if you put it a little bit faster, it sounds a little more confusing and cooler. All right, let's do one more from Tears Are Falling since I love that song so much. There's a particular bend that he does that's really cool because I call it a multi-tiered bend. And there's so much melodic content coming from just one place on the guitar. I have to show it to you guys. So after this whole kind of confusing part, he goes. Such a good sounding bend. It sounds like a human voice singing, doesn't it? I guess that's the point of bending, right? Okay, so it's an idea of going up a whole step, bringing it up just a little bit more, a step and a half. So if you were to fret it, it would be this. 
right? But doing it with one bend could be more challenging. Anything I show you today, be sure you utilize it in everything you do. So you could easily take that anywhere else on the guitar and do the same concept. Let's say you were going here. So it's cool what you could get a lot out of if you just put in a little more effort. I sound like somebody's dad right now, sorry. All right, I call this the dirty harmonica trick because if you've ever heard someone play blues harmonica or blues harp, they would call it, into one of those green bullet mics and do a kind of an overdriven tube amp. It sounds really dirty and cool and I think this emulates it a little bit. It's a simple concept, but a lot of people don't utilize it enough, I don't think, and it takes up a lot of harmonic space. That's why I love it so much. So if you're just doing regular pentatonic and you slid up and did this. <laughs> great sound isn't it so i'm just doing the old typical minor pentatonic in e in this case i know this guitar is goofy but trust me this is 12 here and as we go up i get to the comfortable spot where a lot of people like to hang out and all i'm doing is i'm sliding up so in this case i will talk about notes okay so we're going from a to b so it's going to be the fifth of e we're assuming we're in e fifth is going to sound good of course and then we're going to add the flatted seventh here put them together you get that seventh chord sound. Kind of like this. Emulating that sound with just two notes. All right, wherever you want to do that, whatever key you're in. What I love about this is that you could play it together. Get that Chuck Berry thing happening. Or you could do the harmonica trick and just go back and forth really fast. It was brought to my attention that not a lot of guitar players do what I do uh, because I got this from the country world where you bend a note and you go like this. So I'm using my middle finger and going back and forth. But when I watch guys like Bruce play this, I see more of this. All right, it's got a different sound, but to me it's almost cooler. What it is, is you're just stutter picking is what I like to call it. And that's where you pick like this. But the best part of doing it this way is that on the way down, you can actually do an artificial harmonic if you could do those, pinch harmonic. Wherever you want to do it. And then the up is just the hiccup, the stutter. Sounds weird slow, but if you go fast. It's such a classic sound and Bruce just puts it in the right places. I love it. Now, like I said, if you have a decent trump system, you could do something like this. This is a smooth, rhythmic bar dip. And in Crazy Nights, he does this. It's such a cool way to start a solo. It also helps you improve your rhythm because you have to do it in time. Some people, when they use the whammy bar, they just go crazy. This one, you actually have to dip right with the beat. So you kind of have to have an inner drummer working when you do this. And this is just the third string, G string. We have the 12th fret, 7th fret, 5th fret, the best places usually to do harmonics. You just bounce that trump system in time. It's fun. All right, in the song No, 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 there's a great example of how he likes to tap. He does a lot of six tapping, I call it, six tuplet playing. And the hard part of it for me is getting it smooth enough to sound like how he does it. A lot of people who do tapping, they sometimes neglect the idea that it's basically like extended legato. Sometimes they just think of the tap as almost like a crutch. I hear that kind of stuff a lot. And I used to tap like that too. It was real, just uh, kind of jagged sounding. Like I'd go. Wasn't very smooth. So to get it to Bruce level, we're gonna have to make sure it's very consistent. So let's slow it down first. So I'm really focusing on the pull-offs because that's where a lot of people stumble because it's easy to go and just let them fall off. They have to be brought off with authority to really get clean and uh, in time, precise, I should say. That's why I say pluck off. I don't say pull off because pull off makes you feel like you can just pull your fingers off. Pluck off, although you gotta be careful when you say that sometimes, it's, watch, I won't even tap, I'll just go. 
And you're, I made really strong notes out of that because I'm plucking the strings. Each finger becomes like a pick. So let's put that together with the tap and we get this. to Bruce level, but I'm getting there. I thought I had invented this a long time ago on accident, but the more I listen to other guitarists, I'm like, nope, this has been around a long time. And that's where you take your vibrato bar. It's a huge deal today, your trem bar. And I called it a vibrato bar. I promise I would never do that. Uh, trem bar and, or whammy bar, and you use that as your vibrato. So it's kind of subtle. You get with this kind of sound. Isn't that weird? It sounds like I hit a, a extreme chorus. I do have a little bit of chorus going on, but it sounds like the rate is just going crazy when I do that. It's because the bar is creating the, uh, the vibrato while you're pulling off and the pull off and the vibrato together make this unique sound. It's almost synth-like, you know, when you have the modulation on the synth and you turn it up and it makes that sound, you get that. So I guess this, maybe I call this modulation tremolo pull-off thing. I don't know what I'll call it. This was a particularly difficult technique for me to do. And so I sometimes will just give up and go to my Travis picking. And I'm not rip ripping on Travis picking. It's just part of my style. But I would much rather go like this than to do outside or inside picking for something kind of fast. So here's what I would do. I know this isn't a video about me, but... So I'm just using my pick on my middle finger. But when you watch, I watched a video of Bruce playing this recently and he's just picking everything. So that means really fast outside picking on two strings. So this gets a little tricky when you have to speed it up. So slow it would be. Doesn't seem that hard, right? But there are a lot of little tricks to it. You have to roll your finger and that could be tough. It's like when you do sweep picking. You have to rule your fingers so that they don't create all this uh, extra sound from notes ringing out. So when you do this, you have to do this mini rock back and forth in order to keep the notes separate. And then your, your pick has to do outside picking in an extremely fast way. So closer to speed with somewhere like this. <laughs> to get good at that, I really had to practice just taking two strings and going back and forth. It really sounds like horror theme music. Okay, so these are in every single one of my artist series videos, but every guitar player uses them. Unison bends, they're awesome, right? So it's where you bend a note, but you leave the other note where it is, and they end up coming together, but in a very crazy way, like this. Hear that weird tension that happens before it becomes unison. And sometimes, like in this case, in Thief in the Night, Bruce actually just allows it to, to sound crazy. Some guitar players get them real even and they stay there. But I hear this when he does it. I recommend using them all the time in solos because they can sound really crazy and crude, but they can also be very melodic. Let's say you just put it into a scale. So it's like you're playing a scale, but in a very extreme way. Another song that was huge to me before I got into guitar was Hide Your Heart. And there have been a couple other covers of this song, but I'm used to the Kiss one and I love the licks in it, particularly the descending four pattern. This is another one of those exercises, guitar exercises, uh, turn into a solo phrasing. And here's the idea. It's actually really fun to practice and very beneficial. If you take any, let's just go with pentatonic again, and work your way down in fours in this particular way, it's, it's kind of fun and it flows in a great way. Here I was going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All right, so I'm just doing pull-offs too, and a combination of pull-offs and picking is what makes it smooth. If you picked everything, that's a great exercise too, but it's not gonna give you the same effect of what we're trying to get today with this lick. So if you speed that up and put it in context, it's more like this. So let's try it again.
At least that's how I interpret playing it. But uh, I, just, I like how it rolls off into that bend. <laughs> Another thing that makes this phrasing more interesting to me, the way he does it, is he's not just starting it on a downbeat like like you'd expect, like one E and a two E and a. He's going like this, two and three and four and. So he's starting on the and of four and kind of doing the push into the next part. One and two and three and four and. Just a little phrasing tip for you. Don't always have to start on the downbeat. Speaking of licks, I've interpreted myself, but the idea behind this is actually just the call and response playing. And I noticed live, he does the both parts. I thought maybe Paul would do the low part, he would do the lead, but Paul's busy dancing or doing whatever he's doing. So um, he's doing this octave pattern. This is what I interpret it as. Okay, that's hard enough to really get that perfect. Then you have to jump into a lick. Right into the octaves again. So try that. It's pretty difficult to do it up to speed, to play the low part, the call, and then the response part, and stay even the whole time. It can be pretty difficult. It's like you're, you're playing two parts at once. Could take a little bit of work. A lot of people know about the 12th fret, the 7th fret, and the 5th fret harmonics. Some even know about the 4th fret. But he's doing these really crazy, what I call 2.4, I think that's what they are called, 2.4 harmonics. And that's where if I took the 3rd string and I just played on the, it's not the 2nd fret, but 2.4. So if you cut the next fret in half and just come back a little bit, you get this extremely high sound. <laughs> That can be really hard to hit, can be very tricky to hit live especially, because you got to be so exact, it's like you need a microscope to really get in there. Alright, so he does this incredible harmonic sequence in Boomerang that starts with the 5th frets, and then he goes even higher and does the 2.4 frets. That's hard to do because if you hit them right in a row, they can cancel each other out, so you have to keep them separate at the same time, you get this. But if you just do them all at once, see how they all become one big kind of mess? So you have to still... That's why you'll see a lot of people that are do these type of harmonics, they'll still bounce their finger a little bit. Another tip is to go ahead and take your pick and pick further back by the bridge. For some reason it tightens up the string, or you're hitting it at, at a tighter place in the string and it makes it come out a little bit more. It's just a little side tip for you. I call the next lick the pentatonic motif because I use it a ton because I heard it all the way back to when I first started guitar. Bruce uses it very uh, musically, of course, but here's what it is. We're going to be in G minor pentatonic, and what I want to do is I just want to bend the 17th fret of the third string up a whole step. I'm going to go with the one, two, three finger. I'm not going to use my pinky on this one, which I us usually would. After you do the bend, you skip to the first string 15th fret, then you go to the second fret, just do an 18, 15 pull off. And that's really the, uh, the heart of it, but let's go ahead and put it in a certain uh, phrasing. Sounds pretty shreddy when you go that fast, doesn't it? And that bend ends up becoming very important to keep you on time. It becomes almost like an accent point. Like I said though, you can use your pinky. When you get up this high on the frets though, it gets a little hard to fit everything in there. So sometimes you want to move to the old three finger method. A lot of people ask me this question. I know scales, but I'm not sure how to put them into solos. Just take an exercise that I like to do. It's like kind of like the spider exercise, but we're going to do two pickings per note. Let's stay in pentatonic. <laughs> Whatever direction you want to go, this in this case will go up, will ascend, okay? So in this particular song, Thou Shall Not, great song, there's a part where he climbs up and he does part of a diatonic minor scale and he just double picks everything. 
and he goes into this really wild he got into wah pedal a lot in this album just sounds really great at the end of it i'm going to try to emulate it not sure if i can get close but here's the concept double picking as you ascend to get to the next phrase <laughs> Okay, that might have been way off, but the idea behind this whole part is just double picking a scale to connect your licks. So if a song happens to be, let's say, in the public domain, I don't know if these are, I have a feeling one of them is, and you throw it into your solo, it's a great way to grab people's ears because if they're not really hearing anything that stands out and all of a sudden they hear a little familiar lick or a familiar melody, their ears going to kind of uh, listen in a little bit more. So it's kind of a cool little trick to throw in. Uh, this is sort of how they use it in their context. See, at first you're just like, okay, some chords, all of a sudden, oh, Star Spangled Banner, I know what this is. Okay, so here's another example. Okay, you see how your ear kind of lit up as soon as you heard that familiar melody? Try it in one of your solos, and as long as it's in the public domain, it should be fine. Okay, since we have the wah going, uh, one great thing that you can always do whenever you're doing trills is just to add a slow wah. And just that little swelling of the wah really enhances the sound of this pretty familiar tr open trill in this case. So without it, you would just have this. Still sounds cool. Add the slow wah. takes on a ton of harmonic character just by doing that. I sometimes like to use the wah pedal and just turn it on and just leave it on as a slight filter. You don't always have to do the crazy Hendrix stuff with it. You could sometimes use it in a subtle way. Okay, for the final technique, I need headphones because I have to play along with myself. I have to play with myself. Didn't want to say that, but I did. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to harmonize. We're going to self-harmonize. Then I'm going to show you what, to, what you could do live in that situation if you don't have anyone else to play along with. All right, so let's take part of God Gave Rock and Roll to you and let's harmonize. So the first part's going to go. That alone is very melodic, great sounding, but then we're going to add a harmony over the top of it, mostly in thirds. All right, let's put them together with the magic of a loop pedal. All right, it's always fun to harmonize, but if you're live, I saw him have to do this live one time at a concert when he was just playing the lead by himself. I thought maybe Paul would come in and do the other part, but he didn't. Once again, he's busy dancing and doing his Paul thing, right? So what happens is you just play both parts, one at a time. And it sounds actually more melodic because you're going to go. And this particular solo is perfect for it because it does it twice like that. If it only did it once, you'd have to choose, obviously, one or the other. But uh, most of the time, in this case, whenever there's a doubling of a lick, I like to do at least one of each so that uh, if you can't harmonize with yourself, it's the next best thing. All right, everyone. So that was really fun for me to cover one of my favorite guitar players, a huge influence growing up. He played on so many great songs that I was influenced by growing up. And of course, Kiss has always just been one of the biggest influences in my life. But uh, just learning from his licks and be able to break them down a little bit this week. It's been a lot of fun. And I'm really realizing how much of an influence he did have on my playing because half the time I'm like, weird, that's what I do all the time. So you never know what things will influence you, but it's sometimes fun to break them down and see what makes them tick. So thank you, Bruce, for everything, for all your contributions in my guitar life and a lot of people's and hopefully with this video a lot more so i'll catch you guys later hope you enjoyed it see ya bye